Okay, so disease states, these are pretty instructive. Uh, you know, the key thing is balance. There's no good or bad hormone. It's all about homeostasis. It's all about balance. You can have hormone excess or hormone deficiency. Uh, typically, if you have hormone excess, too high of a hormone, well, typically there's been a failure of a feedback control because all these are under constant feedback control. Uh, so a failure of inactivation. It could also be due to a failure of excretion. Uh, different hormones are cleared by different mechanisms. Or there could be a tumor. Some endocrine tissues, when they become cancerous, oversecrete. Not all, some fail to secrete, but some oversecrete, and that uh, can be a problem. So typically, uh, you can come in with surgery or radiation. You can try to destroy the, the, the tumor. But again, like the thyroid example, that's not always what you want. You're going to take out another completely unrelated endocrine tissue as well. Uh, and trying to design better medicines um, is, is very relevant. By the way, on your case study, your day three case study, you guys all basically uh, did, did a great job and got to one of the key points in terms of, of both diagnosis and treatment. But with, with treatment, you know, most all the groups said, hey, why don't we come up with a better, more specific anti-NMJ receptor uh, uh, targeting strategy, which is great. That would you know, be obviously ideal and preferable to pumping in huge quantities of uh, IVIG from thousands of patients. Um, very similar principle here. How could we design a, a very specific prevention to that uh, hormone? Maybe an antibody, maybe a designer uh, medication of some kind. Now, you can get deficiencies as well. Could start from the beginning, genetic defect. You can't make the hormone tissue loss or death, tumors also, or dietary deficiency. Uh, iodine, for example, required for thyroid hormone uh, production. And in many cases, you can simply supplement. Uh, this can get pretty complicated if it's a pituitary tumor that you take it out. These are patients who are on enormous cocktails of five, six, seven, or up to a dozen different hormones and, and <clears throat> compensatory strategies. Um, but if it's pretty simple, just loss of thyroid tissue, you can just replace with oral uh, thyroid hormone. Yeah, great question. The question is timing of hormone treatments, uh, delivery. Presumably, that's going to be unrelated to when the body normally delivers a pulse or, or needs it. And that is true. Uh, and there are different ways to compensate for that. And so insulin is a great example. Obviously, you need a pulse of insulin when you have a meal, but not other times. And so there are long-acting preparations that dole out the insulin very slowly over time. Uh, so at least you don't get a huge pulse of insulin and therefore a huge pulse of glucose extraction when you least need it. Could be, could be worse. Uh, other hormones don't have this incredibly fine temporal requirement. Uh, so thyroid hormone, you can take one pill a day, and it kind of maintains a, a, a level that seems to address most of the symptoms and tight requirement. And then there's an intermediate ground, like some growth hormones, they, they do have to come in pulses at particular times of day. And in that case, we do try to make the patient take the medication at the right time. Yeah, great question too. But question is bodily compensation. Does your body compensate or overcompensate or problematically compensate for this chronic treatment? And that, if you don't deliver something in a pulsatile fashion, you can get receptor downregulation, for example, a high steady concentration of a hormone in a way the body's not used to experiencing it can indeed cause adaptive changes, which are kind of okay as long as you're able to keep providing the, the hormone, but then discontinuation becomes a problem, and then you've got a situation where the body's got uh, you know, downregulated receptors and, and, and look like they're in a deficient state, even if they're not. So uh, that, that can happen. Um, surprisingly, um, less of an issue with uh, some of the more common endocrine treatments. It hasn't been a big problem with, with uh, insulin, with thyroid hormone, with growth hormone, but uh, it's definitely something you have to be alert to. Um, 
And then there's this other category. You can have exactly the right amount of hormone, but the tissue, downstream tissue, is not responding to it correctly. And this includes some kinds of diabetes, for example, which can be something. Uh, again, you can have a failure in the receptor, you can have autoimmune issues, target tissue, sensitized uh, receptors. Uh, this can be harder to treat. Um, you know, if the receptor pathway is not there, how do you treat it? And sometimes you can overcome it with more uh, drugs, higher concentrations, uh, but sometimes you can't, and that's one thing that makes resistant <laughs> diabetes kind of hard to treat. So let's start with some you know, concrete examples to, to illustrate this. So parathyroid, little things studded in the, in the thyroid. Their job is to regulate um, uh, a steroid-like hormone. It's uh, vitamin D derived. And it's, ultimately, it's about calcium and phosphate, chiefly homeostasis, keeping those at the right level. So they interact with uh, sun, skin, and bone in the following complex way. So first of all, you need uh, sunlight to create the hormone. A precursor to the hormone actually is generated only in skin and only through sunlight. All kinds of deficiencies that can happen. Uh, parathyroid hormone uh, it determines if the active form uh, of this regulator, uh, calcitriol, is, is uh, active. Now, uh, Different downstream tissues regulate calcium and phosphate. The kidney uh, plays a key role in production of calcitriol, but it ultimately comes down to bone. Bone is where most of the calcium and phosphate are stored. Uh, there's also somewhat of a role in the liver and intestine in terms of whether to take up or not calcium and phosphate from uh, the food uh, content. But the bone and the uh, osteoblasts and osteoclasts are extremely important in responding to the Uh, if this fails, if you have deficiency, uh, you get rickets uh, initially, and adequate sunlight, poor diet, liver or kidney disease, or receptor defects can cause this. The bones become uh, weak, painful, uh, bent, impaired growth. The correction is to uh, simply supplement with, with vitamin. Um, vitamin D is fat soluble. A, D, E, and K are all fat soluble. Uh, which means they can uh, actually build up to toxic levels. Uh, there is a risk of overdosing with vitamin D, but in general, it's uh, pretty safe and simple. Uh, what about thyroid? So th thyroid uh, has these very global effects. It's like a, one way to think about thyroid is it's a long-term version of the fight or flight response. You think about sympathetic, parasympathetic, those switch you from kind of a, uh, energy conserving, resting, digesting mode into an active, uh, fighting, running, uh, energy burning state. That operates over a very fast time scale, uh, minutes. Uh, the thyroid is sort of implements a longer time scale version of this. And um, if you have high thyroid hormone, it tends to put you into the high energy state. Low puts you into the low. And what are the symptoms of, of this? Well, it kind of looks, if, if it's too low, hypothyroidism, too low, it looks like a slower metabolism that's inappropriate for the situation. So you have, it's almost like you're entering into a hibernation-like state. You have fatigue, uh, weakness, weight gain, cold intolerance, uh, uh, sense of, uh, uh, you know, the skin becomes cold. Uh, it's, devoting very little energy to maintaining an elevated body temperature, particularly on the periphery. And there can be a depression, too. You can get into a, 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 a psychiatric uh, state. Um, it's caused, you know, there are common causes. Um, you can have a thyroid hormone deficiency, uh, which is coming from the thyroid, and that can be due to an autoimmune issue. There's uh, different kinds of thyroiditis, inflammation of the thyroid, Hashimoto's being a pretty common one. Um, you can also get a medical intervention that destroys too much of the thyroid. Uh, different kinds of surgeries in the neck uh, can contribute. Um, and here a useful distinction is between primary 
hypothyroidism, and secondary. The primary means it's the root cause that the hot thyroid can't produce the amount of hormones that are being called for. The thyroid, like many of the other glands, is under control of the pituitary, and there's something called thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, which comes from the pituitary, goes through the blood, finds the thyroid, and drives it to produce more thyroid hormone. But you can also have a perfectly fine thyroid and still be hypothyroid, and that's called secondary. Thyroid's only a secondary problem. The problem is the pituitary isn't secreting TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, and that could happen due to a central nervous system primary problem. Um, and so a whole host of different possible causes. Uh, people who are hypothyroid tend to look kind of droopy, gain weight, uh, low energy, um, are cases which are kind of uh, uh, amusing, but also a little sad. So, this radiation therapy is a, is a very common cause. All kinds of head and neck cancers uh, get treated with radiation. Uh, usually surgery, chemo, and radiation, that triad is, is uh, quite common. And because the replacement is pretty straightforward, you know, it's, you just simply eat the thyroid hormone um, and it's a pill you have to take and it, that works. So people are less concerned typically about destroying the thyroid gland in, in the course of surgeries. Obviously you'd like to avoid it if possible, but it's not the end of the world. And so uh, people tend uh, uh, to see it as a allowable collateral damage. But in reality, um, you know, that means someone's on a lifelong medication. It's expensive. If they fail to take it right uh, and slip into a hypothyroid state, that can contribute to <laughs> serious medical problems, including depression and suicide. So it's not as minor as you might think. So, you know, improve strategies, imaging strategies to more precisely define exactly where the thyroid is. Uh, and by the way, a lot of you in your case study uh, were right to think about improved imaging strategies to identify the locations of, of, of tumors and the uh, uh, kinds of inflammation going on in the brain. Likewise, precise delineation of the thyroid and, and computer-guided uh, treatment strategies is going to be very important for reducing uh, the tumor. Yes, that's exactly right. So. And there's another problem which I didn't uh, state yet. The you can eat the thyroid hormone. It's it's uh, basically it's something that gets absorbed, doesn't get chopped up by proteases in the stomach. Unfortunately, thyroid stimulating hormone is a, a polypeptide, and you can't simply uh, consume that. So right away, it's harder to treat that. Uh, and second, secondly, there's usually a constellation of problems that are associated with the secondary, and so it's it's often. Primary is pretty straightforward to treat. Now the flip side is uh, hyperthyroidism, too much. Um, major cause is also autoimmune in this case, grave disease. Um, in case you get autoantibodies, kind of like the anti-NMD receptor antibodies, which uh, drove drove it and caused seizures and the other problems that the. the in this case, the antibodies uh, are actually stimulating, they actually act on the TSH receptor and drive it, drive the thyroid to produce uh, thyroid hormone even when it's not needed. And that accounts to a large majority of cases. Um, you get this uh, protruding eye symptom. It's, it's not really that you're hyper alert actually, although it kind of looks like that and they are hyper alert, but there's actually a, a fat pad behind the eyes that gets uh, uh, inflamed and it causes protrusion of the um, that's one symptom that is not uncommon. You also get this sort of constellation of increased metabolic activity. You get tremulous, uh, uh, heat intolerant. Uh, you've got an elevated body temperature often. There's increased sweating. There's weight loss, increased appetite, uh, tachycardia, high heart rate. Um, this, uh, yeah. Their mood. Yeah, it does. Re it, there is a, a pronounced thermoregulatory effect of, of uh, thyroid hormone. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
Um, so how would you treat it? Well, um, you, know, you, you go in and you target the thyroid typically. And a common treatment is radioiodine. So iodine is used for only one thing in the body, and that's to make thyroid hormone. And so basically the, the only organ that takes up iodine is thyroid. And so that's a great trick to use in principle. You can make a radioactive iodine, and it's going to go to only one place, get incredibly concentrated there. And so it could, in theory, be used to target the tumor, and it actually does, and it's still uh, the most common treatment. You can avoid surgery in that case, avoid all the potential complications. Um, and interestingly, it also can be used for diagnosis. I'll show you an image of that in a second, but you can actually, because it's the only place that takes up the radioactive iodine, you can then image the thyroid uh, using nuclear medicine uh, imaging strategy. So I-131 is, is pretty commonly used. Um, gives off uh, gamma and beta particles. And you can actually image, have a sort of a scan that, that's carried out. You can have a photomultiplier tube uh, that detects photons uh, that are uh, released by uh, gamma rays uh, in the crystal. And you can end up with these kind of low resolution. This is a thyroid gland, so you've got sort of centimeter scale uh, uh, features. You can even see this little uh, dip in the two lobes of the thyroid, so it's got that sort of level of resolution. And Graves' disease, you've got this hyperproduction, and so you've got increased uh, uptake, and so you can actually see uh, the thyroid look bigger by this measure. So it works. You, basically, the patient just eats uh, radioactive iodine, and uh, because it doesn't go anywhere else in the body, it actually is safe. It, it causes uh, you know, extremely low incidences of other problems um, in terms of diagnostic and also if you keep it up, uh, therapeutic. Um, but, you know, you still have to be careful. Uh, you don't treat if pregnant. Uh, you stay, you know, away from other people uh, when you're having the uh, diagnostic uh, test done. you got to be careful with... Uh, treated fluids and, and so on. Okay, so that's thyroid. Um, adrenal, this is a pretty complex one. Uh, it gets into this sort of multi-dimensional feature of even a single endocrine tissue. Okay, the adrenal glands, these are these little things sitting on the, the kidneys. Um, if you have an excess of adrenal function, you get a, a complex syndrome uh, called Cushing's. Um, one of the dominant hormones secreted by the adrenal gland are glucocorticoids. These are also steroid hormones. They look like cholesterol, estrogen, testosterone, uh, just with some different side groups. Uh, and sometimes they're given to people. Sometimes you'll give people uh, glucocorticoids. They're used uh, to reduce inflammation of various kinds. Uh, so you'll have people who are, have rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, and so on, taking these. Um, but you also can get tumors that uh, affect the uh, pituitary. There are adrenal stimulating hormones that come from the pituitary as well. And if those get over secreted, or if you have an adrenal tumor itself, you can get too much. Okay, so what do you get? Well, it doesn't fall into a sort of a clear picture in the way thyroid does. Uh, glucocorticoids just do many different things, sometimes uh, uh, forming a very complex picture. But one striking visual thing is a change in fat distribution. So you get a, a deposition of fat, particularly in the upper back, uh, called a buffalo hump. You also get a truncal obesity as well. The skin becomes sort of vulnerable and frail. Uh, you get easy bruising. You get these stripe-like patterns called stria or stretch marks. Yeah. They do a lot of different things, and, and so it's it's hard to capture even in a single uh, uh, lecture. So they regulate uh, uh, sugar levels. They regulate uh, protein translation levels uh, up and down. Um, they, uh, they regulate uh, indirectly the sex hormones. Um, so it's, it's actually an extremely complex picture. It's, it's harder to say glucocorticoids do X. 
If you do say it, uh, sometimes people will say they're a stress-related hormone. Um, but I tend to steer away from that because it doesn't even fall into that picture extremely cleanly. So in a way, it's an example of a multifactorial. It's almost like a, a neuron in a neural network that plays multiple roles in multiple, multiple different memories. And, and yeah, it's crucial for all of them, but it, 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 it does many different things. Um, uh, it regulates uh, sugars, and so you actually can have a big spike in serum glucose after you take uh, 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 these corticoids, um, and so you end up getting dysregulated uh, sugar. You can also get mental problems. People can become uh, psychotic with uh, too high glucose. Um, so, uh, what, what do you do for treatment? Well, you if there's a surgical option for the root cause, again, if there's a pituitary cause, uh, you go for that uh, in some cases. Uh, there are uh, uh, medication strategies, but in reality, this is, uh, you know, those, by the same token, have many side effects as well, so it's a little harder to regulate uh, medically. So typically, surgery or radiation aimed at whatever the cause of the hyperproduction is. Flip side, little action of the adrenal glands, something called Addison's disease. JFK suffered from that, uh, was not widely known. Um, and this is usually, it's an autoimmune attack on the adrenal gland. Um, and you get, again, a range of seemingly unrelated symptoms because of the complexity of the gland. Uh, you have Changes in carbohydrate metabolism, sugar dysregulation. One thing the adrenal does, uh, it secretes aldosterone, which we mentioned before, that regulates salt balance in the kidneys, and so you can have dysregulated blood pressure, uh, dysregulated volume uh, of the uh, content of the, the vascular fluid. Uh, you can get sh shifts in uh, the pH balance of the blood as well. Hair loss as well. There's a uh, glands are also involved in androgen testosterone uh, uh, regulation, and so you can get uh, uh, sort of a hyper uh, uh, testosterone related phenotype. I think you can uh, uh, go for piecemeal hormone replacement uh, of the relevant uh, hormones. 